Welcome to Whiskey Lore, The Interviews. I'm Drew Hanish, the best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Kentucky Bourbon. And not too long ago, I had an opportunity to have a chat with Chris Morris, Master Distiller of Woodford Reserve, and we went through their history and talked a lot about the distillery itself. And then as I was checking my email the other day, I saw that Chris has decided to step aside to an emeritus role. And Elizabeth McCall is now stepping up from the assistant master distiller role to the main seat. And uh, so I am very happy to have her here as a guest today to talk a little bit about her journey and also what is going on now at Woodford Reserve. So welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this is so. Uh, have you had the opportunity yet to kind of, because uh, I know you're probably dealing with a lot of press and, and you know, trying to get everything all set up. Have you realized yet that you are in that master distiller position? Has it sunk in? It, it hasn't quite sunk in yet. <laughs> <laughs> it is still something I'm getting comfortable with, I should say. Yeah. This is something that's been a long time coming, though. You've kind of known this for some time. When when did you know that you would have an opportunity potentially to step into this role? I. It's interesting. Somebody was asking me that the other night, and I said, when I started to train for this role, I knew that I was going to eventually, I mean, the goal was to be Master Distiller. So it wasn't like that. I never thought the day would come, but I just couldn't believe the day has come. <laughs> if that makes sense, you know. I mean, yeah. I had planned for this, and this is what we, Chris and I, both planned for. But and then it's here, and it's kind of crazy. Yeah. So this wasn't something that, like weeks ago, you had any inkling of. It just all of a sudden, like us, we got an email that said, <laughs> "Hey, change." No, we've been planning for it. I mean, we knew kind of just months ago that okay because chris started talking when do i kind of want to retire and then how much overlap would i want to have with you taking on this role and still be there on a day-to-day basis so we kind of knew a few for a few months but then it wasn't until i mean i sat down in the room i thought we were just telling my one of my other now new bosses like oh, this is the plan. And then it was like, oh, no, you're going to assume this title and this is all <laughs> happening. And it was like, oh, God, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is really happening. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your your background. When I talked with Chris, he talked about you and he talked about the transition that he made when he was assistant master distiller under Lincoln Henderson, who was the first distiller at Woodford Reserve. And kind of how the trade-off was going between him and Lincoln. Lincoln had his things to do, but he learned things from Chris. And Chris said that he kind of had that same role uh, with you, that there's this uh, ability to, you know, you you have your own direction you want to go, but then you also kind of pull in fresh ideas from the next generation that's coming in. Um Talk a little about your your role as assistant manager or as assistant manager. I'm going back to my old record store days. <laughs> <laughs> um, as as assistant master distiller, uh, and what your um, what you were learning along the line. What where did you kind of place your focus, and and where did you feel like you had input? So it evolved over time. I felt like I originally it was just I was there to listen learn, absorb, see how Chris presents on the brand, see how, what kind of things does he talk about? What does he share? Um, And then when it came to innovation, really learning how does he innovate? What is his mind? Where does he gravitate towards? And you know, you've spoken to him. He's a huge history buff. So a lot of times he's pulling from history and um, that's sort of his inspiration. And so I've kind of learned how to mingle that with some of the things I'm more passionate about. I like, I love history as well, but I think that I like thinking about just, I'm in the sustainability space in in flavor space and not that he isn't, but it just is, is a, my own take on it. So yeah. I've learned how to, how I can take what he has taught me and he's taught me so much, even from the sales and the, the marketing side of it and how to um, really organize a brand and keep, to the focus of the brand because it's easy to lose 
that and, and get excited about all the things going on. And, and then you lose like, what does this brand stand for? And what's at the heart and soul of it? So he really taught me a lot about that. And, um, and that's been really valuable. I think that'll carry this continue. I mean, it's what's grown wood for where it is today and it'll continue its growth. I think that's what a lot of people don't understand about the master distiller role is that in a way there, there are different facets to it from being an ambassador, uh, position, to being somebody who's maybe more of a production director or somebody who's trying to innovate with new ideas and where does this whiskey go? Where do you feel like your main focus out of those different areas will likely evolve into? Uh, I come from quality control. So my love and passion and all that sits in quality. So I love connecting with the production teams and seeing uh, well, what are what is the data telling us about how how the distillery is doing the sensory ratings on our new whiskey to the the um, mature whiskey. So I really love that. So I'll definitely be tied in closely with that. And then just maintaining the integrity of the brand. I mean, that is something that I think is in the role of master distiller here at Brown Foreman and Woodford Reserve. It's maintaining that integrity of the brand, the liquid integrity, the quality of it. And then of course, innovation. And then you get to do all the fun stuff like brand ambassadorship, but that's really where I will be quality and and liquid focused. Okay. All right. And so talk a little bit about your background. Now you're actually uh, second generation in your family in terms of being in the whiskey industry from, from what I understand. Yes. So my mother, she worked for Seagram's and she was in quality control and, um, but in the bottling aspect. So she dealt with labels and packaging and all the stuff that is probably my least, my least favorite area <laughs> of quality. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I'm being honest. That's more, that's more, uh, just having an eye on making sure every, uh, letter on the label is, is correct. And, uh, that the information on it is correct rather than actually getting in and saying, okay, let's taste this product and see yeah, what, yeah. uh, uh, where, where it's going. So were you working in, uh, Louisville initially, and then you sooner or later came out to Woodford Reserve? So I started with at headquarters. So Brown Foreman corporate is in Louisville. And I started out in that quality control lab. So I worked on all of our brands at Brown Foreman from a quality aspect and was going out to all of our global production facilities. So I started by working in the lab, but then eventually I was like going to France to Chambord and working on Chambord liqueur and to Finland to down to Casa Dura on tequilas. Um, Jack and Canadian Mist, and then and I was out at Woodford, and so the first few times I went out to Woodford, it was just to train people on how to properly nose and taste our whiskey, and um, and of course you just fall in love with it when you go out there. I knew it was a special brand from the moment you lay eyes on the package, but then you go there, and it's just amazing. So, um, so yeah, I started in Louisville, and then eventually I was sent to go work in production out at Woodford Reserve, which was a great experience. I think everybody should have to work in production at some point. <laughs> it's just very demanding in a totally different way. Yeah. Well, and then you got to get to know the warehouses and understand all of that as well. Because, and, and I mean, Woodford, the we think about Kentucky and we think about seven-story Rick houses, but uh, everything's a little bit more subtle at uh, at Woodford Reserve in terms of that. But are there differences? Do you have warehouses that have a certain sweet spot versus others? Well, it's interesting because as this brand has, has evolved, um, we have our historic warehouse C on site that's very um, where we put all of our master's collections and kind of weird one-offs in there and track it. And um, so I know that warehouse very, very well. And then we've, we've since, since 2016, so very recent future, built new warehouses on site. So we're still getting to know the personalities of those warehouses and we're still building more. So I feel like I don't have as much of a, like, oh, this warehouse is going to be, give us this character and this one's not. And they're newer, so they're a little different. Um, but things were coming. We had previously been storing out at Shively, but, you know, with the growth of Old Forester and Woodford, <laughs> we had to separate them. Now Old Forester is all there and Woodford's all out at Woodford. And um, so that's been a great blessing, but, you know, we're, we're still learning. Yeah, 
were you a Woodford Reserve drinker before you started, uh, before you came out there? You know, um, I was, but it's funny. I was thinking back to like when I first started and how I would drink. And it was like the first time I ever drank Woodford on the rocks, I was actually in Canada on a quality audit of our Canadian Miss facility, which is so weird. And I get, and I was like, is that right? And it would have been, I think it was double oaked. And, um, but yeah, and so that was the first that I ever drank just on the rocks. And so that was probably like, you know, 2012, 13, it was very um, early on and it was 13 cause it was now that. And so, um, but before that I was like, what was I drinking? And I guess I was mixing and like in a different, I don't know. It was so, such a, a different space. And I mean, growing up, you know, in college, I was like, what was the cheapest thing you could drink? Cheap beer. You know? <laughs> right. You know? Um, and so I didn't grow up in this culture of like now kid, you know, young people are having old fashions at the bar. I'm like, really? That's so weird. Um, which is awesome. I'm a fan of it, but, uh, yeah, so it, it was uh, an evolution of drinking and then I fell in love with it. Now I don't drink anything else. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I heard an interview with you where you were talking about uh, that you like to drink your uh, whiskey on on ice. And I think that sort of surprises some uh, whiskey people who would say, oh, wait, well, you know, somebody who's going to be a master distiller, they probably get so used to drinking it neat that that'd be the only way that that they like to drink it. But you also got into a very interesting conversation about proofs. Mm -hmm. And there's been this push towards, you know, higher proof, higher proof, higher proof. And yet Woodford Reserve really isn't known for coming out with whiskeys at those those higher proofs. Um, How do you see that evolving in Woodford Reserve? And do you see a need for, you know, having a a focus in those directions or um, as I like to say, I like to taste what the master distiller thinks is the, the right proof for it. Yeah, it's interesting, that whole space. So I do like, so when I'm working, I'm drinking neat. And and then when I'm just drinking for pleasure, like I do like it on, on the, the rocks. And, you know, Chris Morris does too. So and he's done a, had a great <laughs> career. So I think I'm okay. I'm in good yeah. company. But one thing I've learned, and I know from our sensory practices, basically you can hide a lot of defects in whiskey with higher proof. It just, when we're tasting for quality, we cut down to... 40 proof, 20% ABV. And that's going to allow any kind of little nuances to show up. Um, So I think that high proof is fun. I think that it has its place and its moment for, to try something like this is how it came sort of out of the barrel and in, in its natural, most natural state. And there's, I have an appreciation for that, but the sessionability of that not good. Like you have your one drink and you're good for a while. You should not have it <laughs> anymore. You know? yeah, yeah. I do this like professionally. Like I know I've, I've, I've tampered with, with having more than one of those. Um, and doesn't, it's not a good situation, but like, but when you, but then the lower proof, like Chris would talk about his mother when she would cook would have whiskey, like watered down because she was just wanting a long drink and so there's that the the length of it and whiskey should stand up with the more dilution it gets like you should still be like it still tastes so good Mm. it's just minus that ethanol burn and so because sometimes the ethanol can kind of almost kill your taste buds too and you're really not tasting it so there is a fine line and i think when when distillers presented at a certain proof it's because the proof that they're setting is what's going to give you the full com- complexity of that whiskey. And that's where 90.4 comes in. Uh, but we do have a batch proof and it's like Woodford on steroids, but you miss some of the subtle characteristics because it's so high proof, but it's still delicious whiskey. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like you have to have something for everybody and everybody's palate's a little different. I think the trouble I have with it is that I'm of the opinion that if I'm going to get a high proof like that, I may test it out and taste it at at, at that high proof first to see what it's like, but ultimately I'm going to water it down. And if I'm watering it down, I'm not watering. I mean, I can go buy some reverse osmosis water, but I mean, I'm not going to be able to really um, let it set for as long as it probably needs to set to let that water work in and be even. And so it's like, it just seems like a, a waste to me to, to do it that way. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's so, it's interesting because it, the, the high proof sort of thing, it's only really been around and really been 
ex- people excited about probably the last five, six years, maybe, you know, we re- didn't really talk about it that much. And now it's kind of everywhere. So I do feel like it's a trend and talking to people who are out in the marketplace, you just wonder, is it going to last that long? Or will it kind of be this novelty thing that will hang out a little bit and, and then kind of go away? Because it, it's not something that's practical for your day to day, like just, yeah. you know, I'm a day to day whiskey <laughs> enjoyer. <laughs> Not at yeah. the moment because I'm expecting, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like my whiskey. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, and uh, I mean, some whiskeys to me have a sweet spot. I'm probably look for whiskeys on the shelf that are between 95 and 100 proof. I, I just I think that's a great spot yeah. in terms of getting flavor. The 80 proofs, I, I look at them on the shelf and I go, huh. Ah. I just, you know, I feel like I'm going to be missing something with those. But I have had some 80 proof whiskeys that are very flavorful and that maybe that is where they're best. Yeah, I know. It's just an interesting, I mean, it's kind of where does your palate go? And then, but I do think you, you're right. Like to me that that 90 to 100 is so spot on. It's a very happy place for whiskey to hang out. So um, I, I like it. So what's it like working with uh, with pot stills and how much hands on do you actually uh, do at, uh, at this point and will you be doing, I mean, I think of, I mentioned assistant manager before, and I think my job at any store that I worked at when I was the assistant manager was that the manager was off shaking hands with people. I was the one doing all the work behind the scenes, trying to keep everything going. Um, is, is it kind of that same experience in, uh, in a distillery? It's interesting because I I say that our operators take the credit for the day-to-day running the stills, making sure everything's going the way it should. I'm not out there every day doing that. And, you know, and I wasn't in in my assistant master distiller role either. I have always taken more of the like quality approach. So I I meet with them, I talk with them, but I'm not moving the valves and and opening and closing them and and, um, doing that side of the production. Um, But it's on the, okay, well, what were our numbers during fermentation? How did, what was our yield in, in the fermenters? And okay, well, why are they lower? How's our yeast going and checking in on the yeast? So I feel like that's where I hang out more in that space. And I let the operators do the art of running the stills and kind of, you know, hitting the buttons on the computer. I'm there next to them and I'm like, thank God you're doing this. And we have beautiful <laughs> work instructions and SOPs and like, that's kind of, but part of what I do is I try to be there because I want to know it. But I think for me, I would have to be out there day in, day out doing an operator's job to really feel like, okay, I can do this. Because it's a tough job and there's so many little um, things that are just, it takes being there for a 12 hour shift to know how, you know, what, what, when to go over here and, and move it. Because Woodford is not a fully automated production. It is, um, we have computers that we're using, but it's also a lot of like, okay, this needs to run. We've got 30 seconds. We open that valve, and then I'm going to run up here, close this valve. Then I'm going to run back downstairs, close the other valve, and then we're going to go. Yeah, <laughs> You've got to yeah. be very on it. So, like, I've been there with them for that, but I they're the professionals, and I give them all the credit. <laughs> I, I was going to say, that's the real uh, trick with running with pot stills. Uh, that a lot of Kentucky distillers don't have to deal with in that you have to figure out your cut points and you've got to be a lot more hands-on, I think, in terms of making sure you're grabbing that whiskey at the uh, at the perfect point. Exactly. It's like, you know, you got to take your samples every... And when we were recalibrating the stills after we got uh, the three new ones put in um, and we changed up some things, uh, got some automated DMAs, so running the alcohol on the other... the the original pot stills. And so we just need to make sure that those are right. The, are the alcohols right? Are they c- capturing this correctly? So it's fine tuning and calibrating all of that all over again uh, to make sure that the the quality parameters we put in place with when we make the cuts and all that is be hitting the right analytical and um, sensory profile that we have set. So, so far, everything looks good. Um, I'm really, really actually, I mean, it's amazing. The whiskey is like, there's no difference between the original pot stills and the three new ones. And God, that, that is an achievement. Like, and that's just <laughs> our engineers who, who helped design them. I mean, the entire team, it's amazing. So it truly is amazing. 
this is uh, so there. There's all this lore and traveling through Scotland about how your next pot still better be the exact same shape as the old one, and it better have all the dents in it that the old one has. Were you to that point of looking at those, going, okay, we we have to be one hundred percent exact? Yes, um, that that is. We we use Foresight and Sun. That's who they made built our original pot stills. So they had the original uh, blueprints for building those pot stills. So we utilize them again, and I mean they are mirror images, and um, and that is it's true. If anything is different, so it's like I was worried because we don't have the years of crud, if you will. I mean, just all the things in the nooks and crannies that. Um, the original pot stills had and we didn't know how that shifted it so um you can build it right but then it does is are all the little uh what is the right how do i say this without making it sound like our distilleries dirty but you know <laughs> distilleries are there's a lot of like natural occurring flora in there and just things in there that you rely on you don't realize it's part of the character of the place that goes into the whiskey and um and when you put in brand new squeaky clean things you're like oh i think it needs to dirty up a bit but so far we those squeaky clean stills have been running really well and and we did really all of our due diligence to make sure that they were as as similar to the original as possible so um it's it's been good so far so there is a um for people that don't know woodford marries together uh, column still whiskey with the triple distilled uh, whiskey that's coming out of those pot stills. I would be fascinated to know what that triple distilled whiskey tastes like coming out of there. Has Woodford ever considered releasing that as its own thing? So we, yes and no. We In our master's collection, you can, when it's a grain recipe change, it is 100% pot still. Okay. Um, if it's a grain recipe change. Now, if it's a finish, we're usually taking the, the, our usual pot still column, still batching whiskey and putting that into the finishing barrel. Um, but when it's a grain recipe change, it is hundred percent pot still. And what you will notice. So with the release that we have out now, finally, it finally <laughs> released the hundred proof, um, entry. Um, so the historic batch, it is hundred percent pot still. It's our or it's our bourbon grain recipe. And so this will be a wonderful comparison for people to actually see that, pot, like this is pot still whiskey bourbon and it's pot still whiskey bourbon at its finest. It's so delicious. But one thing that I feel like is the signature of the, what the pot stills bring is that malty nutty note that you'll find at the finish of Woodford Reserve. I mean, because if you look at Woodford and Old Forster, they're the same grain recipe. Um, the column still portion of Woodford is made at the same facility that what old foresters made they are very different tasting whiskeys when you mm-hmm. sit down and taste them side by side it's like oh like i've had people say you know i prefer old forester because it has a crisper finish and then woodford has too much of that malty nutty note and it's a little softer and i'm like that's fine that's exactly you know why we have both of them in our portfolio as brown foreman and um and i appreciate both of them and but that pot still is what what it is. So when you do like a personal selection with us and you're tasting individual barrel samples, people will be like, which one's the pot still? And I'm like, if you can tell me which one you think is different and has some of these characteristics and I'll talk, I look like I just described, uh, but I can, I'll, I'll tell you. And then a lot of people, people can pick it out. I mean, it's, it's a very distinctive note. And, um, and it's one that I know years ago they had talked about, Oh, it'll all be a hundred percent pot still all the time. And then as we were evolving the brand, putting the pot still and the column still together was really what was, um, was favor like became the favorable profile. Mm. That was what made Woodford reserve Woodford reserve. So that's what, where we went with it. And that's what it is today. And it wouldn't be Woodford without both components. So 10 years from now, what do you think, uh, Elizabeth McCall's stamp on Woodford reserve will end up being? I think right now it's um, a lot more Kentucky grown grains in our, in our whiskey. So obviously all the corn is from here, but we're working on bringing rye production back to Kentucky for commercial use. Obviously small scale is one thing, but 
commercially on a larger scale is really challenging with our climate. So that's been an encouraging, good project. And then also to get barley. Barley is like what I'm really passionate about um, and learning more. I'm trying to learn a lot more about the barley space and, um, and lo- work with local um, just to kind of diversify our suppliers, which would be really fantastic, I think. So yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you for, I know you're on a busy schedule right now and uh, I thank you so much for taking some time to chat with us and, and have the audience get to know who you are and, and when they see that Woodford Reserve bottle now on the shelf, they'll have a face to relate to it. So uh, c- congratulations on your step up and uh, best of luck to you down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the time this morning and we can chat again when I get, you know, as we go along. <laughs> Settled in. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Che- cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you.